Amen. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Several years ago, I was awakened to something that I had never heard of before. I'd, I won't say that. I'd heard of it. I never knew what it was about. And uh, I can... T what happened to my deal here? I can tell you that Since I've known about it, I don't like it much. There we go. Uh, I was doing a Bible study online, the book of 1 Peter, and was emailed by some people and told that, that I needed to go somewhere else in the Bible and do a Bible study as 1 Peter is not for us in the New Testament church. And I wrote back and I said, well, it's in my Bible. <clears throat> My mom made sure and wrote my name at the front of my Bible, Mike Hoggard. And I said, to me, that kind of spelled out that everything past that page was for me. And uh, so I kind of went round and round with them and found out, well, what they wanted me to do was go to about 16 different websites and read about 85 articles so that I could get my head on straight as to why First Peter is not for me. Well, I, all I had to do was just read First Peter, and I realized it was for me and you and everybody else. And I, then I found out why it was it's supposedly not for us, and I'm not going to get into all. Well, I might get into it. But let me just say to you tonight that, number one, I believe that as, as a Christian, we're going to live and have to endure hardship and suffering and a trial of our faith. Just in a general way, you and I are going to see a trial of our faith. There are going to be things, what kind of darts does the devil throw at us? Fiery darts. I you to ponder that. There are no filler words in the Bible. Every word means something. And if God didn't want it to mean fiery darts, he would have just said darts. But seeing as how the word fiery came out of the Holy Ghost's mouth and into Paul's mouth and he wrote it down, the fiery darts in Ephesians chapter 6, then I just assumed that he meant fiery darts. And the only way to block that is to have a shield of faith. And that faith is, do I believe what God said, how God said it? Is it going to be applied to me the way God means for it to be applied? That's my shield of faith. So if the devil throws a fiery dart at you, your faith will prevent you from being caught on fire. Because I don't like electricity and I don't like fire. I don't like... Be Bless his heart. Caleb, I, I tweeted his picture the other day. He did a pretty good job. He asked if he could help barbecue the meat Monday. And he did. And if you ate bratwurst at our house, he cooked it. And he got her done. There was no red in the middle of those bratwursts. And if you ate pork steaks, he cooked them. And if you ate hot dogs, he grilled them. Did a pretty decent job. But I kept hearing him go, Ow! What's the matter? I burnt my hand. I said, for the sixth time? How many times does it take for you to realize that that grill is hot? And I said, son, if I were you, I would get used to that not touching the hot burger grill. I would get used to that, amen? Because that seems to be your trade for a few years, all right? But anyway, we learn that things are hot, and we want to avoid that. If you want to avoid hot things, you want to avoid fire, then you need a shield called faith that will prevent you from being caught on fire. I can tell you this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a shield of faith, and that prevented them from catching on fire. Did it not? They believed God, and they trusted God, and God did not let them down. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. The Bible says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. By the way, did you know that the word gold, that gold in the Bible, 
There, to my knowledge, there are two or three things that I could find in the Bible whose number was exactly 600, three score and six. And gold was one of them. The amount of gold that Solomon received in a year was 600, three score and six, I'm going to say shekels or something like that. Somebody have to look that up. You look that up. Gold in the Bible is associated with 600, three score and six. All right. I don't know quite the connection, but I've got a few ideas. But I would say that the trial of my faith, I would rather have my faith endure and last than for me to obtain a billion dollars worth of gold. Because what good does it do if I shall gain the whole world and lose my soul? So I'd rather have my faith last than to have a big sack full of gold. Being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. Your faith is going to be tried with fire. That it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now I'll tell you, I'll just tell you very quickly what I believe. I believe that before Christ appears in the clouds, that whoever is alive at that time will have already gone through a trial by fire. That's what I believe. And I'll read more of that. In a little bit. Verse 8. Whom having not seen, ye love. And whom though now ye see him not, ye yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. See, that's where that comes from. Amen. Aren't you glad to be singing songs that come right out of the King James Bible? Amen. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. See, your faith has a goal to it. Your faith. Why do you believe, why, why do you believe now what you believed when you got saved? You continued in that belief, and if you continue in that belief, the end of your faith has as a reward, as a prize, the salvation of your soul. See, God is not done saving you. He's not done. His salvation was a, it started and it continues on. God continues to keep, God, listen, the things that God saved you out of 10, 20, 30 years ago, He's still keeping you out of 10, 20, 30 years later. So that's what God does for us. Anyway, verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And I want you to get that for a minute. When Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, He saw the sufferings that were coming His way. And He, in His human state, said, Father, if... There be any other way. Let this cup pass from before me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So you know what Christ did? He saw at that point, he looked around and beyond the suffering that he was going to ha that have to go through. To the prize and the glorious victory that he was going to attain at the end of that suffering. He saw that. And he said, let's get this going. Let's get it done. Okay? Anytime you're suffering, you listen to me. Anytime you're suffering, and I know about suffering, you know about suffering. Anytime you're suffering, you've got two things. You can either look at the suffering or you can look beyond the suffering. At the prize, at the glory that comes on the other side. Is that easy? No, I didn't say it was easy. But I said you can look at two things. You can either look at the suffering or you can look beyond the suffering at the glory that is to be attained on the other side. And you will say every time, let me go through this. Let me get this done 
and after this, I'll be fine. Amen? I didn't say it was easy, but that's, that's how we do it. All right? Now, there is another place in 1 Peter where Peter mentions this fiery trial. So turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Beloved, verse 12. Beloved, think it not as strange, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened unto you. Now let me stop right here. Let me kind of, let me kind of back up a little bit. He mentions uh, in chapter 1 that the trial of your faith being much more precious than uh, of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And then he says here, the fiery trial which is to try you. All right? Now, here's what I want you to, uh, to understand. There are a lot of people in this world who say, I believe in God. Right? There's a lot of people in this country there are what, 300 some odd million people living in America. That's the ones that are counted. It's probably another 10, 50 million others that won't be counted for various reasons. But if we were to ask all 300 some odd million people who live in America, ask them, do you believe in God? I would say probably we'd get a majority who'd say, yeah. The problem is, does that mean that they're born again Christians? No, the devils also believe and tremble. Okay? Believing in God does not mean that they are saved by grace, born again, and have a ticket to glory land. Okay? Because a lot of people say they have faith. A lot of people say that they believe in God or they believe in Jesus or they even believe the Bible or whatever. But the truth of it is, they really don't. God knows that difference. He knows that about them, that they say that they believe, and yet they don't. God knows it. And what's going to happen is God is going to put their faith on trial. There's going to be a trial. Do you really believe what you tell everybody you believe or what you pretend to believe? Do you really believe the Bible. Do you believe that it is the Word of God? Do you believe every word in it? Is that what you believe? And I am telling you, there is coming a great big humongous trial of the faith of every man, woman, and child on this planet. I think According to 2 Thessalonians 2 and other places, I think that a very big lie is going to be told. I think that lie is going to, and it's meant to, it's going to overturn the faith of billions of people all over the world. And things that they said they believed one day, the next day, they're not going to believe that anymore. So where do you get that? Turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. Let me show you that. Uh, verse 9, 2 Thessalonians, that's hard to say. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. In fact, I'm going to, see, i got to wait on you. You're slowing me down, people. When you get to 2 Thessalonians 2, hold your hand right there or put a bookmark there and turn very quickly to Deuteronomy 13 and see if you can beat me there. Deuteronomy 13. Who's got it? Come on. Out with it, Alicia. Figures Alicia would. Deuteronomy 13. I'm there. Look at Deuteronomy 13. Verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. Isn't that what he just said with all power and signs and lying wonders and the sign of the wonder verse 2 come to pass where if he spake unto thee saying let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them thou shalt not hearken unto that word unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God proveth you you see that right there 
You might want to write down next to that verse, if you write in your Bible, which I think you can, I think you should. It's not that you're adding words to the Bible, you're adding your own thoughts, you're adding what it means to you. You're adding, you could write down here, fiery trial. Because Deuteronomy 13.3, God specifically says that the false prophets were His idea. The false prophets were God's idea. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Jeremiah 51 says. Whose idea was it to allow Satan to deceive Eve? Whose idea was it to have Judas Iscariot be one of the twelve disciples? Whose idea was that? That was God's idea. Okay? So here we have Deuteronomy 13. We have God saying, I sent that false prophet to prove you. To see whether you really believe what you say you believe. Because here comes a guy. He starts talking about all these signs and wonders. He prophesies. He foretells the future. These signs and wonders actually come to pass. And then he says, let's go worship other gods. And God says... I sent him to prove you. Because you say you believe and trust me and you trust my word. And yet now you're going after the signs and wonders. And you're going after other gods. Well that proves right there that you don't really believe what you told everybody you believe. You liar. That's what that means. God said I sent them to prove you. Why do you think that Jimmy Swaggart and Kenneth Copeland and... Kenneth Hagin and Joyce Myers and all these. Why do you think they got so popular so fast? Why do you think that they have millions upon millions of dollars worth of, of um, the ability to broadcast all over the world their nonsense? Why do you think so many people out there are falling for it? Because God is the one who raised up these false prophets. They go around doing lying signs and wonders everywhere. And people are falling for it. Why? Because they didn't really want the truth to begin with. They wanted that particular lie. That's what they wanted. Why is it so hard to witness to Roman Catholics? And, boy, here we go. We're going to get in trouble now. We're going to get visited by the Jesuits in Turkana. Why is it so hard to witness to Roman Catholics who are lost and going to hell? They're bypassing purgatory because it's not even there. Oh, we're going to get a visit now. Amen, John. I heard the, the man upstairs, John. It's because they believed a false prophet called the Pope of Rome. And that false prophet's got his own lying signs and wonders. Like this Pope recently just went and visited Fatima. The Virgin Mary of Fatima. Three shepherd children saw this vision of the Virgin Mary. She gave them all these prophecies and so on and... Two of them have come to pass and one of them still going to... And all this bunch of nonsense. So let's go worship this statue of the Virgin Mary. That's a bunch... That came right out of hell, by the way. We're going to get a visit. Okay? Why do these people fall for this stuff? Because they're appointed unto it, the Bible says. God sends these false prophets out there to do these lying signs and wonders to prove them... Verse, and verse 3 again, whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Because that's what he said in Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6 was, uh, these words which I command, you, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt speak of them. I can't remember all of it, but anyway, you know what it says. All these people saying, oh, I love the Lord God with all my heart. And yet here comes the false prophet and they fall right after it. Boom, boom, boom. There they go. And pretty soon Israel, one day they're serving Jehovah God. The next day they're serving Baal. False prophets were sent because these people were lying through their teeth about what they believed. And God's going to prove them on it. He's going to catch them on it. And I'm telling you, if you look later on at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Who is God going to judge before He judges the rest of the world? Churches. Us. People sitting in pews. They're going to get it first. And what you're going to see is you're going to see a falling away, the magnitude of which has never been seen on this planet before. 
People are going to fall for a lying sign and wonder. And God is the one who's going to initiate it. So, back in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. How much power does he have? Verse 9. How much power does he have? All power. The devil's... Um, his ability to deceive people here is going to be very powerful. Verse 10. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. But, and see the word unrighteousness here? In the parable of the seed and the sower, it talks about the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. Sin will lie. Your sin will lie to you. Every sin, listen to me, every sin has a doctrine attached to it, a false one. And it's usually some way of bypassing the cross to have your sins removed. In some cases, it's it's not even a sin. Don't worry about it. You can do this. Don't worry about it. It's okay. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You know what that means? That somebody said King James Bible, and they ran the other way. They received not the love of the truth. What is the truth? John 17, 17, thy word is truth. That they might be saved. So verse 11, for this cause, God, who sends the strong delusion? God did. Babylon is a golden cup in the Lord's hand. And he uses Babylon to pour out the spirit of drunkenness all around the world. And that wine that he's pouring out is her false doctrine. It doesn't matter what shape it comes in. It doesn't matter if it's called Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness or Roman Catholicism or Buddhism or Islam or atheism. It doesn't matter what name it's called. It's still false doctrine and it's making all the nations drunk with the cup that she represents. So for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in in unrighteousness. So now, back to 1 Peter chapter 4. People, listen to me. People all over the world, listen to me. Whoever God allows this to reach, listen. If we're still alive, when this day approaches, God is going to allow a deception. A deception that is so strong, that is so powerful, that has all the deceivableness of everybody's sin wrapped up in it, it's going to be so powerful that only those who believe what this book says, only those people are going to be the ones remaining standing. The rest of the entire world is going to fall for this deception. What is that deception? I don't know. What do you think it is? Jared, I knew you had something in your mind. I think it's another Christ. Another Christ. Yep. Not bad. Oh, I think his head's going to be beautiful. The real Christ was ugly. If you remember from Isaiah 53, there's no, there's no, no comeliness that we should... Okay? So the fake Jesus is probably going to look nice. Okay? Who else has got... That's good. 
And I don't disagree with anything he said. Who else has got one? What you think the lie is. There you go. That we all serve the same God. I think part of it is, government's going to lower our taxes. Oh. That was a joke. I thought that was pretty funny. What? Go ahead, Rose. Something to do with money? The love of money is the root of all evil. She's not wrong. Think about this. Okay? This Bible teaches... That, and I, I'm not saying this is it, but here's, here's what I've heard other people talk about. This Bible basically gives you the idea that of, out of the entire universe, there's one place in the entire universe where God put life and that it's this planet right here. So there is one place in the universe that has life and there is one God who governs that universe. And there is no life outside of this world. So they dig up an alien. Which we know what they are. They're beasts. They're devils. Okay? So they bring one out or whatever. I don't know. But you hear, you hear, I don't know if you hear this. But I've read the books and watched the videos. I know how they talk. That, let's say that the government's holding evidence of extraterrestrial life. And they're going to release it one day. And when they do... It's going to destroy all of the religious systems of the world because all of the religions thought that we were all here all by ourselves. And so it's going to destroy every religion. Okay? I'm not saying that's wrong either. But you get where that's going. That there is a something that a secret's being kept. When that secret is released, I'll tell you what Albert Pike said in Morals and Dogma. He says, who's... Revealing will overturn heaven and earth. Okay? And he's not, he's not wrong either. There is a lie that is going to be told that is going to, that is going to change everybody's perception of everything. And when it does, the Antichrist is going to rise and say, I am God. I'm sitting in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. I'm in the temple of God, and I'm showing you that I am God. I will be the I not I not I will be like the Most High. I am like the Most High. So, Jared, you were right. Rose, you were right. Who else? That's Second Peter chapter three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That evolution's right. And that we did come from a lower form. And now we're about ready to go to our next higher form. I mean, all of these are great ideas. And I think all of them work. The bottom line is, how's your shield doing? How's your shield? Because fiery darts, fiery darts are being thrown now at you, are they not? Things that are meant to try to trip you up, faith-wise. Because what is it that saves us? Faith. It's the only thing, the only thing that saves us is faith in God's grace. So the devil already is throwing fiery darts at us, and he's trying to ignite and spark something in our minds that is totally against the knowledge of God in this book to get us to stop believing that any part of this book is 100% true. All he's got to do is convince you that one verse out of this Bible is wrong. That's all he's got to do. All he has to do is convince you that one verse out of all of these verses in the Bible is wrong it's been proven wrong. The theologians all agree and the scientists all agree. It's been proven wrong. 
See, this is why I'm on this tirade now about if we don't believe that this Bible's right and pure, what in the world are we doing here? Why don't you go eat, drink, and be merry and go do what you were doing before you supposedly got saved? Because that's where you're headed anyway. Amen? Believe what this book says. And I mean every part of it. Because in the one place where you don't believe it, that's where the devil's aiming his fiery dart right at you. And all he needs to do is hit you with one spark. And you'll go up like an old dead Christmas tree. You ever seen an old dead cedar or pine tree go up after about two weeks after Christmas? <laughs> they're gone. Okay? Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now I want you to take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 3, and I'm not going to go... Um, wow. See, I could go quite a bit tonight. Matthew 3.11 You were told that it was coming. You were told that it was coming. Matthew 3.11. Here's John the Baptist. What are we? We're Baptists. John was one of us. Amen. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with what? Fire. Now, you believe that. You believe what John said? He's going to baptize you. And by the way, he's not saying that the Holy Ghost and the fire are the same thing. That's not what he's saying here. They are two separate things. The Holy Ghost and with fire. Now turn to Acts chapter 1. I want to show you something. Remember what John said. John, in fact, I'm going to leave it up on the screen. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with... I'll say it for some of y'all. Far. Did y'all understand that one better? Matthew, did you understand that one? Far. Okay. Like... We know what the wise men did before they came to see Jesus. They were firemen. The Bible says they came from afar. All right. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Where was the fire baptism? Huh? Hang on a second. Since you said that, turn to the next chapter, Acts chapter 2. And I want you to look at verse 16. Peter said before that, these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. <laughs> Obviously, Peter didn't know some of the drunks I've known. <laughs> okay? <laughs> they were already well lit at the third hour of the day. Uh, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And we know that that did, in fact, happen at Pentecost. It did. Now look at the next verse. He's still quoting from Joel, chapter 2. And I will show wonders in heaven and above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and what? Fire and vaporous smoke. Then the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now he's done quoting Joel here. But I want you to notice that on this day, the signs, the wonders in heaven, the blood, the fire, the vapor of smoke, the sun and the moon, none of that happened on this day. Does that mean Joel got it wrong? It means that there is a partial fulfillment on the day of Pentecost. And there is going to be a latter perfect fulfillment 
at a certain day. The Holy Ghost is going to be poured out. On that day, the sun is going to be turned to darkness. The moon to blood. There will be fire on that day. Okay? That day has not come yet. But it will. The Holy Ghost baptism is now. The fire baptism is coming. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew about it. They had it. And they made it through, did they not? You will too. You will. Now right now, if you ask me to just walk through a fiery pit, I'll tell you you're nuts. I'm going to go home and go to bed. But there's coming a day when God is going to try us by fire. Okay? And if your faith is secure, you'll be fine. Trust Him. You'll be just fine. You believe the Bible? Don't believe me. Don't trust me. You read this book and you know this book. I don't know much. But I know the one who does. And as we see that day approaching, he is going to guide us faithfully through every one of those days. And I promise you, you're going to make it. I promise you, you will. That much I know. Roland's going to make it too. You're going to make it, bud. Okay? One day at a time. Let's stand to our feet.